Hey, family and friends. My name is Donnie. I'm a part of the teaching team here at Revive, and I'm so excited to share with you in the conclusion of our series, Disciple Shift. Jesus said something powerful to the first disciples in Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. He said, come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. We must understand in order to fish for people, we must first become followers and disciples of Jesus. And as we become faithful, dedicated disciples, then we'll be able to become good fishermen, which God has called us to. So, you know, the disciples, they said, yes, we will follow you. And they were following Jesus. They were watching his teaching. They saw miracles that he performed. Uh, and, and, and they came, became very close to him, even up until the resurrection, his crucifixion and resurrection. Let's pick up the conversation that Jesus has with his disciples after his resurrection. Jesus gives clear direction and how to go about being a fisher of men. Come with me to Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 through 20. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Then they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey every, everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age." I have an interesting short story I'd like to share with you. In the 1940s, the United States ship line proposed to build a new ship, and it was to be called the SS United States. This was close to $80 million project. It was going to be the largest ship ever created in America and the fastest ship in the world. The United States government upon hearing about the project, invested $50 million into the ship. It was the government's plan for us to use this ship to become a troop carrier to transport some 10,000 troops into battle if necessary in the time of war. But in 1952, the SS United States finally set sail, but it never set sail as a troop carrier it was setting sail as also one of the fastest traveling uh, ships in the Atlantic, breaking records. But again, it was never used as a troop carrier. Instead, it was used as a luxury liner catering to wealthy people. And since 1996, the SS United States has been docked at a pier in Philadelphia, and it's still one of the most popular tourist attractions but it sits there decaying, and no one knows what to do with the SS United States. Friends, Matthew 28, verse 18 and 20, is a simple reminder to us today that the church is a troop carrier, not a luxury liner. The church is a spiritual war vessel, not a tourist attraction. See, we are all on mission for the Lord Jesus Christ. And the last command of Jesus must remain the first priority of the church, us, the body of believers. By the time you get to the final uh, chapter of Matthew's gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ has now already taken place. And now we see the post-meeting that Jesus has with his disciples. And I want you to picture with me now. Uh, the, the disciples hanging out on some hillside Galilean hill uh, that, that, that Jesus told them to go to when they see the resurrected Jesus approach them, they all fall down and begin to worship. Matthew notes in verse 17, uh, he says, it says in verse 17, 
But as they worshiped, some of them did not actually believe it was truly Jesus. Some of them doubted. And despite the doubt, Jesus still approached the disciples and entrusted them to carry out a world mission. He's basically saying, see, now it is time for you to go and become fishers of men. You know, when I read this, I'm blown away at the grace that Jesus had that he decided to entrust these men, even though that they had doubt with a worldwide movement. Uh, which, which means, and it says to you and I, that even in our doubts and even in our insecurity sometimes, God is still patient with you and I. Also, we see here that Jesus is, dedicate, is deciding to use weak, sinful, doubtful men, or better yet, people just like you and me, to carry out the mission to the world. These men had no money. They had no programs. They had no building. They, had not, they didn't have resources. But he still wanted to use these people, these men, to go fishing in, in, in the world. Also, I want you to think about something. I know a lot of us feel like we are not worthy or we have not reached a certain mark to be used by God. I just want to encourage you. It doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done, what you've gone through, what you've seen, what you're dealing with right now. God has the power and the authority to use who he wants, when he wants, whenever he wants. It is the enemy that tries to challenge our minds to make us feel that we uh, 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 are not qualified. But that's why we must be transformed by the renewing of our mind. The word renewing means a daily renewing. God is the one that makes decision who he wants to, wants to use. And I just want to tell you, whatever that voice is telling you you're not qualified, it is a lie from the enemy. We must just remain in the posture, in the place, humility, waiting and, and, and being available to be used by God. To become fishers of men. See, the early church, they took this mission of Jesus very seriously. Uh, we see here in Acts chapter 17, verse 6, uh, they were told that when the disciples had arrived to the city of Thessalonica, the locals said that the men that have turned the world upside down are here in our town as well. The disciples that they're talking about that turned the world upside down were Paul and Silas. You know Paul and Silas in the chapter verse uh, 16 that these guys were broken free from prison by the power of God. And immediately they begin to uh, uh, go fishing for men and they, they, were, they were really focused on become, make, uh, making disciples. They were going from city to city. They were going from house to house and they were spreading the good news of Jesus and actually creating disciples. So... The religious Jews, the Bible calls them jealous, begin to look for Paul and Silas because they were very upset. When they got to a man Jason's house, they did not find Paul and Silas. But what they did find is they found, dis they found a group of believers in community having a life group. And so these Jews, they jumped on these people. And they were very upset. And see, Paul and Silas were fishers. They were fishers of men. And they were making the kind of disciples that when problems and challenges came they, their way, they were able to stand the test of time. The Bible calls these people that were on mission to make disciples. They, the Bible says that these people were turning the world upside down. These type of disciples were, were, were turning the world upside down. Friends, I came to declare to you today that the gospel of Jesus Christ still has the power to turn the world upside down. And God is stilling to use weak people just like you and me to spread the message of the gospel around the earth. But friends, we must first stay focused on the mission. We can't afford to lose sight of what God has called us to. We must ensure that in our generation, the Great Commission does not turn into the Great Omission. So the question is today, what does it mean to be a fisher of men? 
Number one, if you're taking notes, you must believe the claim that Jesus makes. The Great Commission begins in verse 18. And for the record, it's not a commission. It's a claim. Jesus declares all authority in heaven and in earth has been given to me. And no doubt we know that God has all power, but he is communicating something more than just power here. Uh, we all know that power is the ability to get things done, but authority is jurisdiction. It's the freedom of action. It's the legal right to use power. You know, I love the sports world. And in the sports world, one of my favorite teams is the Rams. And I had the privilege of being a sports dad. My son plays football. Uh, I quickly learned from Pop Warner to now, he's a junior in high school, that when he's running the ball, he's a running back, and when he's going 10, 15, 20 yards, and I'm standing up, and I'm yelling, go, 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 go. But you know what frustrates me when I hear that whistle blow and that ugly yellow flag they throw? That means, guess what? The ball is coming back. Uh, and, and guess what it tells me, too, is that the referee is the one that decides actually what happens on the field. He is the one that's in real control of what's happening on the field. The, the, the referee can, 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 can make a game slow down. It can make a game go forward. Some fans can get mad at a, a referee. Some can get fans ha happy that a referee made a call. But what we see here is that the, author the authority of the referee trumps the authority of any player or any athlete on the field. I just want you to know that Jesus has the same a, a power and authority here on earth. That, that, that nothing can trump the authority of Jesus Christ. Nothing can trump the authority of his decision. So what does that mean, Pastor Donnie? That means that he has the authority over your finances right now. He has the authority over the challenges you're having in your marriage that you could be going through right now. He has the authority over every situation that's going on. Yes, he has the authority over the government system. He has authority over political views. He has the authority over protests and even the president of the United United States, Jesus declared that all authority is mine. And see, friends, on earth, his authority is more than just land and sea. It's about people. Jesus cares about people. He cares about people. He cares about people groups. He cares about uh, regardless of religion, uh, regardless of ra race and location and status and background and ethnicity. Uh, the Bible says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus says to his disciples, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The power that he's talking about is the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of Jesus that lives inside of us. That spirit uh, is not just overcoming power, but it gives us the power to carry out the mission of the gospel. It, it gives us the power to carry out the mission and to make disciples. But first, friends, we must believe that Jesus has authority. And unfortunately, some people don't believe it's true. And can I encourage you not to question the claim that Jesus has based on uh, the, the, the local news that you hear or, or Instagram or Facebook or all these social media outlets. Uh, the, the, you say, prove it then, Pastor Donnie. The proof that the claim is true is the fact that Jesus lived to make the claim. See, Jesus was beaten, arrested, tried, convicted, and crucified. But God raised him from the dead. And now the resurrected Jesus, I said the resurrected Jesus declares that all authority has been given to me. In order to be a fisherman, number one, we must believe the claim that Jesus makes. And number two, we must obey the commission that Jesus gives. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Jesus says, therefore, go make disciples of all nations. Remember we read earlier in, 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 in scripture that he says, there will be a come a time where I'll come send you. Well, here it is. He's saying to go. Ladies and gentlemen, the most important part of the great commission is to make disciples. Disciples are followers. 2,000 years ago, uh, they would follow the rabbis around to be with them, to learn from them, um, and, and as a result, to become like them. 
So it is with the disciples. They hung out with him. They spent time with him. They set up with him for an appointed time like now for them to go. And it's the same thing that, that he said to the disciples is what he's saying to us today. And we are to, to be like the disciples. We are to follow Christ. We are to become disciples. And then, and then eventually we are to then now go become fishers of men. And, and let me be clear with this. Uh, going is not just for a select few. Being a fisherman is not for a select few. It's not, it's not just for pastors or preachers. It's for all of us who claim to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Disciples make disciples, and disciples make fishermen, become fishermen. Disciples make disciples, and disciples become fishermen. We make disciples by going. The first action word in verse 19 is go. Notice Jesus did not tell the world to go to the church. He told the church to go to the world. Jesus says, as you are going, make disciples. It's not a certain ministry that goes. It's not a certain people that goes. It's not for a certain season that you go. As long as you're alive, your whole life is your season. And as long as you're alive, we should be going. Uh, disciple making is a lifestyle. Disciple making is a lifestyle. What do you mean, Pastor? Like, as I'm going to work, I'm, I'm discipling. I'm discipling as I'm, as I'm in my neighborhood. I'm discipling as I'm around my friends. I'm around my family. The things I do, the way I say, uh, it's discipling. It's not a sit-down, one-on-one session. It's a lifestyle that exudes the love of Jesus that, 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 uh, that attracts people. We, are, we want to intentionally enter into relationship with people to help them follow Christ so they, too, can be a part of the mission. And we do that by going. That's how you become a fisherman. See, a, fish, a fisher of men must, must make disciples, though. It's not about just about going. You, the purpose is to make disciples. We make disciples by baptism. Jesus said, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus makes it very clear. After you make disciples, you mark disciples by water immersion in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And in baptizing, we identify ourselves with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this is our statement of commitment to Christ and our commitment to the mission of the church. And of course, baptism does not save, but it is the first step to obedience as a disciple. Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, For all of you who were baptized unto Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Oh, I want to be like Christ. Uh, I, I, I can't be crucified and, and, and hang on a cross or anything, but, but this is one of the acts that I get to identify uh, with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ through baptism. How do we become how do we make disciples? Number one, we make disciples by going. Number two, we make disciples by, by baptizing. Number four, we make disciples by teaching. See, the only way that a disciple can step into real spiritual maturity is by the teaching of the word of God. The Bible says in verse 20, and teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Disciple making requires faithful biblical teaching. And what I love about our church here at Revive, we teach the word of God. We don't, we're not selective in the word. I, I, I'm not, I don't care about any, what any, any, I know a lot of people are doing a whole bunch of other stuff. But what I love about the church here is that we are not selective on the word. We teach the entire gospel. We teach the whole Bible. And see, a true disciple must spend quality time in the word of God, not rushed. I know you got a busy schedule. I know you got a, a, a hectic calendar. But we must carve out quality time where we can spend with Jesus. It's called abiding in his word. John chapter 15, verse 7 says, Jesus says, if you abide in me and my word remain in you ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you here's the key here's the key verse 
this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciple. Friends, uh, uh, what makes you and I and others disciple is spending quality time in the word of God. Uh, sitting under teaching and, and, and not just receiving teaching, but we must obey the teaching. The word says, be, obey all that I have command, not just your favorite sections of the word of the scriptures and my, my go to's. But 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 we have to we have to obey the entire gospel, the entire word. Most people uh, like to also hang their hat, you know, on being knowledgeable of the word and, and, and how many scriptures they know and how many theology degrees I have. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. But being knowledgeable uh, does not make you a disciple maker. See, just being knowledgeable doesn't make you a disciple maker. Judas hung out with Jesus. He heard his teachings. He hung out with him. He saw him do a whole bunch of things, but we don't see him included in the group. It was 11, the Bible says, that went out and took action behind what they learned. Judas wasn't a part of that group, but those that were a part of those that group were passionate, consistent, faithful, come storms, uh, uh, valleys. They were staying true to the mission of the gospel of Jesus Christ. A true disciple must obey God's word and put action behind what you know. It's not enough uh, just to know the word of God. The Bible says faith without works is dead. We must be doers of the word and not hearers only. Then you begin to bear fruit. John 15 says that this is what shows that you are my disciple is the fruit that you bear. This is what makes you a spiritually attractive, right? This is what makes you spiritually attractive is the fruit that you bear. So the question is, what are you bearing? I know it's early in the year, and I know you had a whole bunch of uh, uh, things that you want to accomplish and uh, uh, things that you wanted to do, but, but have you thought about um, on my list of things that I want to do is I want to bear fruit? Are you bearing love? Are you bearing joy? Are you bearing peace? Are you bearing forgiveness? Are you bearing patience? Are you bearing long suffering? Are you kind to one another? Are you loving your disciple? I mean, are you loving your neighbor as yourself? If we stay connected to the vine, the vine, which is God in his word, this is what you'll bear. You'll bear much fruit. We all know that life is short. And I don't know about you, but I want to live a life that is bearing fruit. The Bible says fruit that remains. Whether I'm here or I'm not here, I want there to be fruit in my life. Number one, we must believe the claim that Jesus makes that all authority belongs to him. We must obey the command that Jesus gives, which means to go. We must embrace the comfort that Jesus gives, which is the Holy Spirit, the spirit of, spirit of Jesus. And then we must go fishing for men. But we must be equipped to go fishing. I love the last part of the Great Commission. Notice Jesus doesn't say, I will be with you as you go make disciples. But he says in verse 20, Surely I am with you. I am with you. Maybe someone needs to hear that. Whatever your situation is right now, whatever you're going through right now, he says, I am with you right now. Before you even go, you got all this power and all of this uh, love and joy, which is the spirit of Jesus inside of you. He's with you. So when you take that step, you're not going on your own, but you're going with the power of the Holy Spirit that is working in you even right now. I don't know about you, but that makes me confident to move forward, not just for the rest of this year, but, as, and for, but for years to come. God is calling you and me to be fishers of men. And again, it's not just for pastors and preachers. It's for all of us, church. You know, this is, reminds me, this whole fishing and fishing for men is when I turned 40, 
man, I was going through a tough time, you know, just turning 40. You know, I felt like I was an old man. I already don't have hair and growing a beard. and A lot of things are happening. And so if you're not 40, guess what? It's coming. But my wife did something nice. She surprised me with a, with a guy trip. We all went on a big fishing trip down to Catalina. Um, she surprised me, and uh, I was really excited. I was in a low place, in a dark place, and she was trying to get me going. We got on this boat, and I went out on the boat and fisher, fishing with these guys, a group of guys. We go all the way out on this boat, and uh, we get to a certain spot, and the guy says, okay, go ahead and start fishing now. I start fishing. I didn't catch any fish. I started getting frustrated and friends of mine that were catching fish. And again, I was in a dark place turning 40. My wife sends me on a fishing trip. I'm catching no fish. My wife booked a time for a certain amount of time uh, to be out there in the boat. And uh, the time was, 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 was coming to a close. I looked at the gentleman that was driving the boat and I said, hey, man, you know these, these waters better than I do, don't you? He said, yeah. He said, you really want to catch some fish, man? I said, yeah, what does it take? Pay him a little extra money. The guy got on the boat, drove me way out. About, I don't even know how long that was, but we were going deeper out, deep, deeper. We got all the way out there, we dropped it. The, the fish, uh, the, the, you know, cast, cast my, in the fishing pole, cast. And, and, and then all of a sudden, you hear this sound. That means that you caught a fish. And I got so excited that I finally caught the fish. But what I came to realize in that process is that the guy that knew the waters knew where to drop me to put me in the right place to catch the fish. I came to encourage you that God has strategically placed you in the right place, in the right community, in the right location for you to become a fisher's to become a fisher of men. We must pray and ask God to open our eyes to show us lost people around us. And so that is what, 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 what makes me feel so confident about going fishing for men is that God is the one that has sent us. He wants us to take the rich teachings that we get on Sundays and in life groups and our times of devotion to share with those that are lost. I'm reminded of the words of Paul that he used to encourage Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.2. 2, it says, what you have heard from me in the presence of my witnesses, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Stay committed to helping others. Stay committed to teaching others. Stay committed to discipling others. I want to encourage you, church. It's time to now go. If ever there was a time to go, the time is now. God can use you. He wants to use you. We must open ourselves to be available to say, God, use me, send you, send me whatever you want from me. I'm here. I'm available with my mess, with my challenges, with my issues. I know that you will use me, Father, and I'm available for you. Hey, let's all start going fishing today. Can I pray with you? Father, we just thank you. We thank you for who you are. And we thank you that you chose us to be the hands and feet. You chose us to allow our fruit to be a witness to others. God, show us, even now, lost people, show us how to even be a disciple, God. We give you glory and we give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, if it's your first time 
uh, watching or gathering with us and you say, hey, I want, I need more prayer or, you know, I just need someone to talk to. I need to connect with someone. I'm, I feel lonely. Hey, connect with us. We have ways that you can connect with us. Um, we'd love to, to, to put you in a community. Uh, we are here for you. We love you and we're praying for you. I look forward to seeing you guys soon. Have a blessed week. Thank you for joining us today. We love celebrating with you all that Jesus is doing. These sermons are always intended to lift our spirits and draw us closer to God so that you can live in freedom. If this was your first time experiencing Revive Church, we want to welcome you. You're already part of the family. We also want to make an invitation to you to connect. Reach out at the information below and say hello. We would love to pray with you and journey with you in your life. Also, we thank each and every single one of you that has partnered with us. These services are made possible by your prayers and generosity. If you'd like to give, we have three easy ways that you can do that. Your partnership and faithfulness to God allow us to reach more people with the gospel. It's definitely encouraging to know that you have decided to participate in the mission of sharing the gospel with the world. And before we say goodbye, don't forget that we suffer in isolation and heal in community. Don't do life alone. Life Groups is an important part of life at Revive. You know, for me personally, Life Groups has changed my life. It has encouraged me in some of the hardest weeks of my life. So connect to your Life Group this week. If you need one, please let us know and we'll happily plug you into a Life Group. The information to reach out is on the screen and send us an email or a text message. There is a Life Group for everyone, regardless of where you are in the world. Don't miss our next online service at the same time through the same medium. We have special things planned just for you. Follow us on social media to stay connected to all things Revive. Now go, offer hope, ignite hearts, and live in freedom.